uh, Leo Tolstoy was a 19th century Russian, uh, excuse me, uh, Russian novelist and short story writer. He was a man who struggled with the thought of death. Uh, and so it showed up often in his realistic fiction. One of his best and most personal works was a short, short story called The Death of Ivan Ilyich. And in this story, Tolstoy exposes and demolishes our default self-centeredness. He introduces us to this man, Ivan Ilyich, who is a successful high court judge uh, of the late 19th century Russia. He is a man of high social standing with a desirable position among the courts. And so we're given uh, insight into Ivan's rise on the ladder of success. He comes from a prominent family. Uh, he gets into this great school that parlays him into this career in the law courts. Uh, he advances further in his career and he's able to buy his family a nice house, which he decides one day to decorate. And so he gets on this ladder to hang curtains and by fluke, he falls and he bangs his side. All right now at first it's nothing, but after a while begin, he begins to notice a persistent pain in his side and a bad taste in his mouth. So think about the irony here. Ivan spends his whole life climbing the ladder of success, but everything changes when he falls off of a ladder. This accident turns out to be fatal. It's a death sentence. The rest of the story is about Ivan coming to grips with the fact that he is not just ill, but he's dying. And as he comes to realize that he can't seem to wrap his mind around it. And in the first chapter of this short story, as Tolstoy is explaining the vibe in the room of Ivan's colleagues when they hear of his death, he says of them that the mere fact of the death of a near acquaintance aroused as usual in all who heard of it, the complacent feeling of it is he who is dead, not I. Each one thought he felt, well, he is dead, but I am alive. See, somehow, we all uh, have this ability to push the reality of death out to the outer fringes of our minds. And so long as death remains remote and unreal, Jesus' promises will too. So you, you cannot appreciate or understand the meaning of life until you process death as a reality for you and others that you love. Uh, Matthew McCullough, he's a, um, an author. Uh, he wrote a, a, an amazing book called Remember Death. And he says this, and this is, Amazing. He says, so long as death remains someone else's problem, Jesus will remain someone else's savior. So we are in the third week of our four week series that we've been calling rebellious fidelity. And again, rebellious fidelity defined is a fierce and unwavering commitment to a cause or belief, even in the face of opposition. Something or someone sits on the throne of every heart. We all give allegiance, ultimate allegiance and authority to something in our lives. And I would submit to you that God must be that thing. And everything else, as I said a few weeks ago, is the Flint River. Everything else is the marshy land of Pisa, right? Everything else is, uh, as in the story of Ivan Ilyich, is a ladder that you spend your whole life climbing that you eventually fall off of. In this series, we are breaking down one of the more famous passages in the Old Testament, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So I've been quoting this the last few weeks, so say it with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Amen. So the past few weeks, we looked at what it means to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Uh, we looked at what it looks like to lean not on your own understanding, but today we're going to look at the third part in all your ways, acknowledge him. Now, all your ways means there is a long list of areas that we can use to explain what this looks like, right? But the area that I wanna focus on today is grief, all right? And so with that, uh, we're gonna begin by hearing a testimony from my friend, Sherry Canfield, as she shares her story of grief and loss and really beginning to trust the Lord and submitting her ways to God through it all. And so as she comes out, will you guys stand up and give her a hand as she shares her story?
Tina, you said something today. When you're asked if you're okay, be honest. And I thank you for that. Because I'm not okay, and many of you know that. I wrote this, I've been spending time writing what I was going to say, but I'm just really going to trust the Lord and lean on this when I need to. I love you. I love you too. And I have to say, I knew when I came here, I would see faces in the crowd that have been by my side praying for me, and I thank you for that. There's so many of you. So, okay. June 17th. My daughter is ready to have her baby girl, her fourth grandchild, her fourth child, my grand, fourth grandchild. She had already determined her name was going to be Heaven. She called me and said she was on the way to the hospital. And so I was excited. My husband and I had a breakfast date planned and cooked dinner and cooked breakfast and I left to head to the hospital, hospital to um, be with my daughter and greet my new granddaughter. On the way there, I heard the song Heaven Changes Everything by Big Daddy Weave for the first time. I cried with joy. I was like so excited to meet my granddaughter. And get there, my daughter has a rapid birth. She's there by 7.15. The baby is born by 7.50. And uh, they had to work on Heaven for a while. She had some fluid in her lungs. My daughter was stable as far as I knew. And uh, quite frankly, the father came in um, after she had the baby, and I wanted to honor their time, and I left and checked on the grandkids at the apartment. She has three older ones at home waiting for mom. All they know is mom left this morning to have their baby sister. I come back to the hospital. My daughter um, is hemorrhaging. They don't know, they don't know how to stop the bleeding. And uh, eventually, a, a big crew of doctors and nurses come in. They ask us to leave because they wanted to give her a blood transfusion. At this point, I am standing in faith. My daughter's fine. She's going to be fine. God has this. She's good. It's her fourth child. What could go wrong? I'm in the waiting room. There's a chaplain there. And I reassure him, I'm good. Like, I, I, I know God. I'm praying, too. I'm praying out loud. We're good. The nurses come in and tell me that she's flatlined. And that they got her back. And I'm like, what the? And I did not say heck, but what is going on? What is, what, what is going on? The second time they come in, they tell me my daughter died. At this point, there's really no family at the hospital yet because, again, everyone's getting ready to come see her. Like, she just had the baby. We were, you know, honoring her space. Letting, and she's, of course she's tired. She's had a baby, you know? My husband, my daughter, my son, everyone gets there. We're all in shock. And we very quickly realize we have three kids at, at home waiting for their mama, and we have to go talk to them. So, as a family, we go back. We let the kids know what happened. My youngest daughter and her husband, they've been here. They've been here for prayer to have a family. They had decided to go back to the hospital and stay with baby heaven. We, my, my, th my thought was, she's fine, she's with nurses, we need to, talk to, the, we need to be with kids. But they decided, because there was no, no one else that was going to at that point, um, not anyone that you would think would be there, okay? So they stayed with baby heaven for three nights and um, didn't leave her side. We stayed at the apartment, packed up the all within a week. Time does not stop when you lose someone. All, everything that you had to do, you have to do and more. So let me just say, the next several months, I went through guardianship court, social security office, all the things you have to do when someone dies. Not knowing how the, 
Heck, <laughs> I was going to get through it. I had no idea. I barely made it through each minute. But my grandkids were depending on, on us, were depending on me. I had no choice. And I do better in those situations. I'm guessing all of you can relate. I had to push through. You know, there was moments I was at the Social Security office and I did not want to be there. Crap, I did not want to be there. I couldn't even barely form a thought, much less take care of these things. And I saw, I was waiting in line outside and I saw, and I didn't have an appointment. And if anyone, anyone has ever been there, you know, you're going to be there all day. There was a feather in the bark. And I'm like, oh. And, I'm like, and it kind of brought me comfort. I was, you know, it was a sign to me from God and my daughter. I even felt my daughter saying thank you. I go in this interview, and number one, I'm seen right away, okay? <laughs> I'm seen right away, and you know that's a miracle in itself. I'm sitting there answering all these questions, not wanting to be there, and I look down at this lady's name, and it's Miss Feathers. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Nothing like confirmation, right? And it just, it lifted my spirits. So let's move forward to, now I, every day I'm angry at God, folks. I still, I mean, I still battle with that. I'm angry, I'm asking why, how, how are we going to do this? How are the kids going to get through this? Why? Like, why on earth? Make sense of this for me. My daughter and her husband take baby heaven home. Now, backstory. For two years, they have been trying to have a baby without any success. My, when my oldest daughter was pregnant, she was even afraid to tell her sister because she knew how hard they were trying to have a baby. And she even told me she wanted to have one for them, like she would do it if, if need be. They bring baby, help, baby heaven home, who is absolutely a miracle, and they get guardianship of her. And they're also in the process of adoption, so prayers for that would be really greatly appreciated. After two years of trying to get pregnant, they're home with baby heaven. <laughs> My daughter, when heaven's 11 months old, or let's just put this, baby Harper was born 11 months after baby heaven. So from there, trying to have a family to not being successful, they now have two beautiful baby girls. So God's been in it, and um, my biggest thing, there's been so many times, my grandkids are my heroes, and I'm sorry I'm stumbling, but my grandkids are my heroes. The perseverance, they have shown the strength. They're the reason I get up every day. If I didn't have to take them to school and make them do what they need to do, I don't know where I'd be. I just don't, and I've not knowingly been depending on God, okay? I've been angry. Um, so I'm still in process for sure. I cry almost nightly, not as often, but as soon as I'm not busy, busyness has been my friend or not, right? As soon as I'm not busy, I'm crying and by myself. When Harper was born, let me tell you, I didn't realize how much anxiety and fear I had because I was in the room with my other, youngest daughter too. There was a moment where she had to get epidural and they only wanted one person in the room with her, which was obviously her husband. All these nurses and doctors came in, and I was in the back, and I almost felt like I, I wasn't even there. I was just watching like from the corner of the top of the room, and I suddenly panicked. I turned around and started crying, and I didn't want my daughter to see me, because this is what happened before my other daughter died. The nurse came up to me and said, ma'am, do you mind going outside? We can only have one family member in the room. And I was so thankful. I went outside and bawled. Fast forward, she's in the hospital. I went home to try to sleep. She looks great, but so did Courtney, right? Courtney, I mean, she was just tired as far as I knew. I didn't really exhale until my daughter the next day got her IV out and was eating food, and I knew she'd be going home. I didn't realize how much fear I had. It was so unusual, like to lose my other daughter. It could happen any, at any time, right? The other piece I didn't realize until I saw my new baby, Harper, my granddaughter, how blessed and what a miracle heaven is. 
She was so swollen and bruised from that rapid birth. I, I didn't see it at the time. I was too much so thankful for this little baby that we're, we're truly, she's a miracle. She's a miracle that she is here. And I'm so thankful. Now this testimony, I know it's been about rebellious fidelity. And I feel like, number one, if you guys haven't heard that song by Big Daddy Weave, listen to it, listen to the words, and grab your tissue. But especially after knowing this story, this testimony, heaven changes everything is even more of a deep, it's just such a deep statement. My daughter is at peace. My daughter is whole. We, every day, are struggling with the adjustments of having two teenagers in our home. They're mourning their mom. I'm mourning my daughter. So it certainly has its bumps, and I don't know how sometimes that we're going to get through it. But I, re I believe in this at this moment, and in these last, since June 17th, the rebellious fidelity. I'm going to read this because I don't believe I can say it without going back to my page, but it's been, I'm going to turn it around for you. To me, this is a testimony of his rebellious fidelity, his fierce and unwavering commitment to a cause or belief, even in the face of opposition. And that's been me and my family. I haven't knowingly been going to him, but I know he counts my tears. He knows my heart. He can handle my anger. He can handle my questions. And it's okay not to be okay. So that's, that's what I have. Oh, I want to thank you all, too, because during that time, the, the, this body stepped up, provided everything my family needed, including prayers. My best friend's here, and her husband, Ron. My honey's here. And there's many of you in my small group that I've been a stranger to for quite a while. In fact, I've been watching church online. I haven't wanted to be here. Um, just being real, because I'm never this vulnerable. But this experience didn't give me a choice. I had, I, I had no choice but to be with the people that came around me. I was a mess. I was an open wound. So I thank you, and um, I, I pray if anyone is in the same situation, it's okay. He can handle every bit of your emotions. Um, I need some powerful woman of God to come up here and lay hands on my sister, Tina. Come on. Lord, thank you for my sister. Thank you for her life. Thank you, God, that you show up in these moments. God, I thank you for the unique consolations that come from the most heartbreaking moments. God, we thank you that though she is in process, you're here. Now she told us about the moments that she has seen you show up and confirm your presence. We thank you, God, that those aren't flukes, but you truly are with the brokenhearted. You are near the brokenhearted. God, we just thank you. We thank you for the strength that you're giving her. The vitality that she needs to do this. She thought she was done raising teenagers, and yet here she is. Thank you, Lord, for how you're going to show off in her life. Thank you for that. Father, we just um, we just welcome your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Yeah. So, Father.
Father, right now in Jesus' name, um, I even just pray over Sherry physically. God, I ask for your presence to come, even touch the trauma center of her brain, God, where the her body is reliving things and her brain is replaying things. We just call on the light and fire of the Holy Spirit to just cut off the attack of trauma, the attack of the spirit of trauma and the spirit of death against her and her family. Okay. We just call her physical body to peace in the name of Jesus that the scattered thoughts would come into alignment, that anxiety would cease. I just pray for an increased awareness of the nearness of a father who has also lost a child. And as a, as a body and as brothers and sisters, we just speak over you and speak to your soul and say, um, take as long as you need. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for your nearness, God. In Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you for Sherry. We thank you for the strength that she has to say, I'm not okay. We thank you for the catalyst that she is, that her words would go out like a pebble hitting the water in waves, and that each of us would find the strength to say, I'm not okay. And for us to be able to stand with each other, Lord. And be okay with people not being okay. Let us be a church where Sherry feels like she can come. And that we will mourn with her. And that we will care for her. And I got the word resilience. Because that's, that's what you are. You are resilient. Even though you didn't want to, you did. Even though you felt like you couldn't, you did. Yeah. And so, Lord, we thank you because even if you were in the background in her mind, she thinks, we know you were in the foreground. We know you were going before her. Yes. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help Sherry to give herself grace yes. and we just bless her Lord and we thank you for her in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Thank you, everyone. It's not lost on me that <laughs> the same day we, that we do uh, baby dedications. We're also grieving the loss of someone's child, amen. Welcome to the pastorate, by the way. This is, this is pastoral ministry right here. Um, I would say, I laugh about this, I would say every, every text message I send and every message you get from me that says happy birthday, congratulations, Happy anniversary. Aaron and I are usually sending another message saying, you don't have to go through this alone. We're praying for you, All right? Um, so maybe you've heard this quote before, a mother is only as happy as her unhappiest child, All right? That's kind of what this feels like. Um, but this should be the life of every believer, All right? This is not just pastoral ministry. This is the life of every believer. I want to make that point here. You know, our, our modern culture does little to prepare us for suffering and does not teach us how to grieve well or how to grieve together, uh, but doing both is profoundly biblical. I want to show you this. So Paul in 1 Thessalonians, he ends his letter uh, this way. Uh, in chapter 4, he says, Brothers and sisters, 
We do not want to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, right? And so to acknowledge him and to submit all of our ways to him in the area of grief, um, I think we need to know what grief is, what to do with grief, and how to overcome it, all right? So um, I know it's 1130, all right, but I can do this. All right, so I want to share with you guys real quick. What is grief? What do I do with grief? And how do I overcome grief? All right, so first, what is grief? Uh, Bruno Mars and Lady Gaga. That's the way to start a point. So they, they have a, po a very popular song out right now. I think it's actually top five billboard for five weeks straight. They have a, a really good song out right now called Die With A Smile. Uh, and their lyrics can help us here. So listen to their lyrics. It says, I just woke up from a dream where you and I had to say goodbye, and I don't know what it all means. <clears throat> but since I survived, I realized wherever you go, that's where I'll follow. Nobody's promised tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to love you every night like it's the last night. If the world was ending, I'd want to be next to you. If the party was over and our time on earth was through, I'd want to hold you just for a while and die with a smile. If the world was ending, I'd want to be next to you. Now, that's sweet, isn't it? It's a cute song, okay? Right. All this love and sentimental gush, right? But what got them there? You know what got them there? A dream. It was a dream. He had a dream that he was separated from someone he loved. This song is about him processing death as a reality and the grief he felt in his subconscious was enough to make him appreciate her more now, all right? And so I think we all understand it just by watching. This is not a dream for Sherry, all right? This is not a dream for Charlie Sexton, whose precious wife Cindy died earlier this year. This is not a dream for Steve Hart, whose precious wife Lois died earlier this year. This is not a dream for the friends and family members of Deborah Barlow who died just a couple weeks ago. And this will, not be, this will not be a dream for you either. All right, not to be a buzzkill, but I'm just trying to pastor you here, okay? Right, that, that one day, the party will be over for you and you will have to say goodbye to someone you love, right? Grief is when that dream becomes your reality. Grief is when the tomorrow doesn't come. It's when the, when the party really is over, right? Grief, by definition, is a recognition that something is not as it should be. Something pivotal is missing. All right, now, grief doesn't just happen in death. All right, we're all grieving things. We're all grieving things. I know people who had a dream to be married, and they're grieving the fact that this day may, may never come for them. Uh, I know people who are grieving, uh, grieving the fact that they, like uh, Sherry shared, people are, are grieving the fact that they wanted to have children and if not being able to welcome children into their home, right? You can grieve the end of a relationship that you really enjoyed. Maybe you have friends or family members who've moved out of the area. You can grieve seasons, right? I grieve the season of my kids being really small. <laughs> not saying anything about them now, but it, it was just a moment that I thought would always be there, and now it's not. You can grieve things like that. Right? You can grieve the loss of opportunities. Maybe you've worked hard for, for, for something. Maybe you tried to make a career move and it didn't pan out. All right? You can grieve a lot of things. Uh, Megan Fate Marshman, talked about her last week. I'm going to talk about her a few more times today. She's a teaching pastor in, in uh, Southern California. Uh, she became a widow in her 30s. Her husband died in 2020. Shh. All right. Um, her husband died uh, uh, in her 30s. And this is what she said. She said, what we have dreamed for our lives can never be. Thus, we have a choice. We can spend the rest of our lives angry, trying to protect ourselves against something that has already happened to us, death and unfairness, or we can grieve our losses, abuses, and deaths, and through that eventually attain the joy and delights that are in fact possible for us. So we face many deaths within our lives, and the choice is ours whether those deaths will be cancerous, Right, where they'll actually you know, snuff out our life and spirit or whether it'll be a catalyst opening us up to new life and spirit. And grieving is the key to the latter. 
Grief is actually good for us as believers. Uh, Christian pietism says that if you grieve, you're in sin. Uh, but scripture doesn't support that. It doesn't support that. Job, if you look in the Old Testament, listen to this. Job, when his kids died, he tore his robe. He throws ashes on himself. He falls to the ground. He shaves his head. He screams. He cries out. And yet the Bible says in all these things, Job sinned not. He sinned not. Yeah, in the average Christian community, I think if, if someone like Job was among us, we would look at him and say, okay, here's a man that doesn't have much faith. See, grieving is both an appropriate response to a world that is out of alignment with God's original design and a longing for the day when the world will be made right again. Grief is the antidote to trauma. It is, as Megan Fate Marshman says, it is the healthy response to loss. Trauma leaves us feeling stuck. Grief has the power to move us either downward into our hearts or upward to lament with God and then ideally outward towards others as we allow them to carry our burden alongside us. And so many of us shy away from grief, uh, fearing that it traps us, but actually avoiding grief is actually what really keeps us stuck. Amen. So that's grief. That's grief. Now, what do I do with it? All right. Secondly, what, what do I do with grief? All right. Now there's a... <laughs> quoting a lot of songs today. There's, a, there's another song out by a group called Johnny Swim called Let It Matter. And the female vocalist in the group is grieving the death of her mother, and this is what she says. She says, I don't want to feel better. I don't want to feel good. I want to feel it hurt like losing someone should. I'm going to let my heart break. I'm going to let it burn. I'm going to stake my claim with the flame I know we've earned. Run, baby, run, don't you know I've tried, but escape is a waste, ain't no use in hiding you. No, the best way over is through. So if it matters, let it matter. If your heart's breaking, let it ache. Catch those pieces as they shatter. Know your hurt is not in vain. Don't hide yourself from the horror. Hurt today and it's here tomorrow. If it's fragile and it shatters, let it matter. Let it matter. Music just has a way of saying what our heart feels. Amen. We need to learn how to grieve. If it matters, let it matter. We cannot heal what we're unwilling to feel. Amen. In John chapter 11, Jesus shows up at his friend's funeral, and there we get the shortest verse in the Bible, right? John 11, 35. Uh, we get the shortest verse in the Bible where it says Jesus wept. But what translators don't really capture is that this wasn't just a few silent tears that he shed, right? That, that a much better English translation of the shortest verse in the Bible is that Jesus quaked with rage. That's a better way to say what he was doing in that moment. Jesus cried violently, so much so that the next verse after this, John eleven thirty six, 36, the, the people that are there are looking at him like, man, look how much he loved him. It was much closer to a booger cry than it was just a few tears coming down his face. And so why would, the question is, why would Jesus weep when he knew he was about to shut this funeral down and raise his friend from the dead? That's the question. Jesus could have bypassed the pain of grief, but he knew we would need a tool for the moment we face death and loss on this earth. And so instead of taking a shortcut and avoiding tears, Jesus modeled for us, what to do when we face these moments. Grief. Grief. Jesus, who never sinned, grieved. Because there's nothing wrong with grief. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was mature. Jesus was full of faith. He was full of hope. He was full of love. He was full of eternal perspective. And he grieved. And so the pain of living in a broken world is often hidden from us. And when we experience it, our world tells us that grieving is a sin. It tells us that we need to keep it together, that grieving won't help. It tells us that death and loss is natural. Um, and so we just need to accept it. But Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 says no. He says no. He says, don't be uninformed, my brothers and sisters. Don't grieve like the rest of the world that doesn't have hope. And what he's saying is go ahead and grieve. Just grieve hopefully. Grieve hopefully. Hope is a superpower of the believer. 
Hope is the life-shaping, joyous certainty of something. And so we have hope that although this world is not as it's supposed to be, it won't always be this way. Right? Paul in Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And so we need to learn how to grieve personally. But another part of learning how to grieve is to let people love us and serve us in our grief. I don't have time to really break this down, but I just want to say this that the way of Jesus is depicted best when a community of people are joyfully bearing one another's burdens. If you don't let us grieve with you, we all suffer. We all suffer. Another way to learn how to grieve is by preaching the gospel to yourself. Now, I would never do this to a person in the moment. I think when someone is freshly mourning, the ministry of presence is the best. But if you want to get over grief, you got to learn how to preach the gospel to yourself, right? You, you, you got to, you got, you got to learn because after Paul tells us, don't grieve as those who have no hope, he then says, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. In chapter five, before his final address, he says, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. You have to tell yourself over and over and over again, Jesus will make this right. He will make this right. I heard a story of a, of a, of a preacher who was actually either on his way home from or headed to his wife's funeral with his children. And so they're in the car and they're driving. Um, he's driving with his children, their mother, and he wanted to comfort his youngest child that was struggling. And he said to his youngest son, he said, son, you see that truck? And the boy said, yes. He said, D do you see the shadow of that truck? And the boy said, yes. He said, would you rather be hit by the truck or by the shadow? His son said, by the shadow. And this man, being wounded by the loss of his wife and wanting to encourage his son, who had just lost his mother, said, because Jesus was hit by the truck of death, your mother only had to go through the shadow of it. Can you do that? you got to learn to do that. you got to learn how to massage the gospel into your heart. And don't wait until you're grieving. you got to do it now. Right? And this is what I want to say to those of us who are not grieving right now. You massage the gospel into your heart now and prepare for your own grieving now by learning how to grieve with other people now. Psalm 147.3 says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Who do you think he uses to bind up their wounds? You. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We have to learn how to grieve with others. So grief is real. Grief is good for us. It's, it's, it's an appropriate response to a world that is out of alignment with God's original design, but we need to grieve hopefully. We have to let it matter, amen. Right? We need to allow people to serve us and love us in our grief. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves, and we need to learn how to grieve with others. All right, so lastly, how do I overcome grief? Worship team, you guys can come back. How do I, how, how do I overcome grief? Sean, how, how, how do I do this? I, I want to acknowledge God in all my ways. I want to submit to him in the area of grief. How do I do it? H how do I know when I'm better? D do I just get over it? Do I, uh, do I eventually move on? No, right? Well, one of the deepest desires of the human heart is a love that lasts, all right? So you don't just move on, right, from, from death or significant loss, but in death and loss, you and I receive unique consolations from God that we never could have received otherwise. We never could have received it. I don't know if you guys saw it, but Sherry radiates 
with the glory of God. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, Megan Fate Marshman, um, again, she's the, the lady whose husband died, right? She said this about grief. She said it's a gift she never asked for, All right? And so grief is a door into something God wants to give you. You know what that is? He wants to give you himself. He is the reward. He is the reward. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Uh, George Herbert uh, was a, a 17th century English poet and orator. He was a very successful man, um, but he suffered from poor health his whole life and he eventually died young. And he said this about death. I love this. He says, death used to be an executioner, but the gospel has made him just a gardener. Did you hear that? Death, believer, listen to me. Death used to be an executioner, but the gospel has made him just a gardener. So long as death remains someone else's problem, Jesus will remain someone else's savior. But when we all learn how to grieve, grieve our own losses, when we learn how to grieve each other's losses, the Bible promises us that the Lord is near. So, so how, how, how is the Lord near? How can he come to us in our, in our grief, in our brokenness? How does he do this? He does this through Jesus. The shadow of death and loss will always, as in the case of Ivan Ilyich, it'll always be a bad taste in our mouth and a pain in our side. But Jesus took on the bad taste. On the cross, Jesus said, I thirst. And they gave him something to drink that was so nasty that after tasting it, even in his desperate need, he refused to drink. And Jesus took the pain in our side. John 19:34 tells us that to prove that Jesus had really died on the cross, the Roman officials stabbed Jesus in his side and outpoured blood and water to confirm his death. See, death is our ultimate enemy, but Jesus conquered it because three days later, he rose from the dead. This is what enabled Paul to say that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor present things, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in creation. Through the finished work of Jesus, death and loss has no lasting claim on the children of God. And so, Jesus died for the party. Because of Jesus, not only is the party not over, friends, the party never ends. It never ends. Amen. Will you stand with me? So, um, again, I've been reading a book by Megan Fate Marshman. So she has a, a book where she talks about grief. And she talks about her process of mourning her husband. And in it, she says that she got out a pen and a piece of paper and she began to write down all the things that will not be in heaven. She wrote all the things that will not be in heaven that she could think of on paper. I think that's a good exercise, all right? Let's think about this for a second together. What will not be in heaven? Death, mourning, crying, pain, cancer, affairs, anxiety, heart disease, cerebral palsy, CPAP machines, foster care, prescriptions, worry, divorce, rejection, loneliness, feeling left out, laundry, hallelujah. I'm believing, I don't know for sure, for sure on that one. Apathy, arguments, suffering, longing, fear, depression, hurry, 
family dysfunction, wheelchairs, walkers, abuse, nightmares, radiation and chemo, racism, middle of the night phone calls, thank you Lord, self-hate, sexual abuse, eating disorders, comparison, failure, breakups, acne, autism, suicide, sin, dissatisfaction, burdens, pornography, alcoholism, wrinkles, muffin tops, angry neighbors, persecution, welfare, glasses, dead grass, browning plants, single parenting, election years, prosthetics, disability, funeral homes, nursing homes, waiting rooms, double chins, I won't look at anyone, shaving, traffic, hormones, dieting, shame, blame, hiding, condemnation, accusations, fear of the future, heart attacks, gossip, sadness, badness, and I'll end here. The Bible says in the book of Revelations, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. All things new. Because of Jesus. Wow. Because of Jesus, not only is the party not over, friends, the party never ends. Never ends. So here's what we're going to do. If you're here today, I know it's late, but if you're here today and you are grieving or you need to grieve, but you've not really felt like you've had permission to do so. All right, we wanna create space for you. Our, our altars are open. Our altars are open. I challenge you to do something very uncomfortable. If you know you need to grieve, come forward and allow your brothers and sisters to gather around you and comfort you and pray for you as you grieve. Amen. Come forward. I've made you stay late. I'll make you stay longer. Jesus, we just thank you. We just thank you for this house. God, we thank you that you are 
creating a culture here, God, where it is okay to not be okay. But Lord, as we look at you, as we look to you, as we do all we can, God, to trust you with all of our hearts, to not lean on our understanding, but in all our ways to acknowledge you, God, that you would just teach us to be people that can be real, that can be transparent, that can be vulnerable, and that can share what's going on in our lives. Lord, I pray a blessing over all the families, all the homes in this house. And I release them, Lord God, in your loving care. I just thank you.